Okay, so we're going to do running for office, the 101 version, all the nuts and bolts of how to run for office as a Green Party candidate and the things that you want to consider. Um, we already talked a little bit about why it's important to run for office, and we came up with different reasons, which I'll recap in a minute. We're also going to talk about important considerations, so things that if you're going to be a candidate, you really need to think about and think about seriously before you make the decision to run for office. And most of this is really going to focus on what I would call the arc of the campaign year. So what are you doing now? And, and, and I'm talking about a run for, let's say, November 2018. Um, it's obviously a little too late at this point to be running in 2017 since it's October. Um, but what do we need to be doing between, let's say, now and February? What are you doing in the spring, the summer, all the way leading up to that date um, in November? And then if you are running for office and you're making that decision soon, what are your immediate next steps um, from this moment on? All right, so why run for office? So obviously we talked about to win, right? You know, the whole point is to gain power, that we are a political party. That is what it is about. It is to make sure that our voice and our agenda, our issues, actually have some weight and carry the day. And that when people are making decisions about how to spend our hard-earned tax dollars, and what policies to be putting forth, both locally at the statewide level, nationally and abroad, that our values, the 10 key values, are there front and center, right? That is the whole point of this enterprise. Um, so winning is important, but as we discussed before, it's not the only thing, right? At some level, we can't sell out to winning. We actually have to still keep our values front and center. And that is what makes us different from the other two major political parties, is that our values ground us and keep us focused on what the ultimate win is. And the ultimate win is that political change. It's not the winning of any given office, right? So, and bringing visibility to an issue, I mean, there's a whole long, wonderful, awesome history about how third parties have changed the conversation, right? Everything back from the abolitionist party, the Women's Party, I mean, these movements also had political parties that pushed the two-party system to adopt these key issues. And so some of us think of the Green Party in that light and, of course, hope we take it to the next level and actually win office and become a major party. All right, and of course, to build the Green Party. So, right, the, the infrastructure, the, the people power to get all this work done is critical, and I've seen way too many candidates and campaigns really suffer from not having a strong local party that can sort of just jump in and plug in and fill the gaps in terms of volunteer needs, kickstart that fundraising, etc. You know, no successful campaign can pretty much do it only on Green Party power. There's just not enough of us to actually get someone into office by ourselves. But we have to be the core. We have to be the group that's there from the beginning that propels our candidate to the next level who can then pick up the unaffiliated, all the voters who have not paid attention to what's going on and they're suddenly like, oh, there's a real thing here. But it has to, you know, the snowball has to start with something, right? Um, and so we have to be that core. And so building the Green Party and making this a viable force is a really important goal for running for office because it's a long-term strategy. Like, we're not gonna win overnight, but we have to build the capacity and the infrastructure so that we can get there in the future. All right, and then there's other reasons. So one, you know, in terms of more nitty-gritty stuff, like I often tell people who wanna run for office, you know, somebody will say to me, well, I wanna run for, you know, if you would come to me and said, I wanna run for Congress, um, you know, if you'd come to me last year, I would've said, we'll run for something local this year. Just get your name out there, you know? Um, get practice, building your campaign team, setting up a database, figuring out the campaign finance stuff. All of that takes time. And you make your mistakes now in a smaller run in order to figure out how to do it so that when you're running for the thing you really want to run for, you know, you've got some practice and some name recognition. There are many people, our current president included, who have run for office many times and lost. And yet they go back out there and they do it again. And who knows what the special sauce is. You know, like Trump ran really unsuccessfully in the Republican primary once or twice before, I can't remember. But you know, he was a joke, and yet here we are, right? So like <laughs> I mean, there's many, many examples of people who have run and lost, picked themselves back up and run again, and the timing was different, the external 
conditions were different, their competitors were different, who knows? And so running for office is can also be a, a you know infrastructure building just for your own self and your campaign to then be enable you to get there the next time around. And then of course there's other reasons. I think obviously the other group here is more about like it's all of the above, right? But there are, there are other reasons and whatever it is that's motivating you, please consider a run. It's obviously um, it takes a lot and puts you in a vulnerable position. The question of like would I be recorded? Well, you know, if you're a candidate, you're basically sort of being recorded 24-7. You know, you're out there in the public putting yourself in front of folks and what you say might be recorded by someone in the audience and put up on the internet and you have to live with it. Yeah. What was that? Tweet it. And tweet it, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So all right. So some important considerations. And this stuff matters and I think we don't often talk a lot about it in the Green Party, but there's both personal considerations and political considerations. So I think one of the personal the personal stuff is important. And I, again, I think we sort of gloss over it. But do you have the time to do this, right? If you're going to run for real, for real, and run a credible campaign, whether you have any shot of winning or not, there's still levels of credibility. If you're going to run a campaign where it looks like you could win, it's you know it could be a full-time job. And so the question is, like, do you have that time? And for most of us, no, because we have other full-time jobs, right? We have kids, we have families, we have parents to take care of, whatever. But do you have at least 10 to 15 hours a week, I'm going to say, to put into this, and then possibly have to take leave of absence of a final stretch, right? So that is not an insane ask for someone running for Congress, right? Now, if you're running for like something much, much smaller, local water board, maybe it doesn't take that kind of time. Of course, that's the kind of office where you probably, it's probably not a full-time job if you win. So there's sort of that, you balance it out by that. But do you have the time to actually do this? Um, what's your stamina? Do you have the physical strength to be jumping in the car or getting on the bus or, what, or getting on your bike, however you're going to do it, you know, going to community meetings three nights a week, five nights a week, getting up the next morning. Aaron said to me yesterday that he had gotten up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do something. He's not the candidate. He's volunteering. He's preparing something. And then we were here flying and up till 11 o'clock at night. I mean, it's just, it can be a very physically demanding job. And so just think about that. Um, you know, what about your finances, right? And of course, I'm not trying to say that you have to be wealthy to run for office. That is by no means what the Green Party thinks and believes and practices. But you have to have some means to possibly if take that leave of absence on your job, be available. You have a vehicle to drive around the state if you're running for statewide office, perhaps. And I think also to think about, are you going to donate to your own campaign? And if you are going to ask other people to give up their hard and earned money because they should believe in you, well, you need to believe in you too, right? So, so think about that. And then, you know, the skeletons in your closet, like what is going to come out about you? And are you okay with the whole world knowing? And the answer in this day and age, like whatever it is, it will come out. Um, you know, if you're running a serious, incredible campaign, there will be people out to get you, so to speak. And it could be fine. It could be that whatever you've done, you're told, like you've been to jail, great, for whatever reason, whether it's for something, you know, you've been to jail because you were protesting or you've been to jail because you stole a car when you were 16, who cares? But um, it will probably come out, and are you okay with that? Is your family okay with you running for office? And not just exposure, but being out of the house at all hours, you know? Um, so just all that is something to really think about. And then of course on the political side, you know, what's the context? Like, is this the right office for you? Is this the right year? Is this the right time frame? When Robin says I'm gonna run for county commissioner, well, why county commissioner? Why not Congress? Why not state representative? Why not? Whatever, you know, why this particular office at this particular time? What's the context? Who else is running? Is there an incumbent? Are they, is the seat open because the incumbent has retired or in sadly many cases these days gone to jail? Um, you know, how winnable is it? But those kinds of things really can help you decide whether or not this is the right time to run and whether you're the right candidate. And then I think the capacity of your local party, like what resources are you starting off with? 
what is, what is it you have to work with, knowing that you're going to have to build, but are you building from scratch, or are you building because there's already a really strong foundation? So any questions or comments? And I know some of you have actually run for office before, Karen Moran, so if you want to you know, add anything from your experience or things that maybe you didn't think about and really wished you had or whatever. Yeah, um, okay. yeah I'll just give you very quickly on the availability and stamina pieces. This is one of the reasons it's really crucial to have a team. Because if you don't have to do your own financial reports, that's time and energy you've got saved. If you don't have to be the one coordinating your volunteers, that's time and energy you've got saved. Even having somebody who's just willing to drive the candidate around to events so they can prep on the way there instead of dealing with traffic, huge addition to their stamina. Okay, so there are a lot of roles for people who aren't the candidate to help the candidate out. If you're gonna be the candidate, you really need to make sure that your family is on board and that they know they're not gonna see you <laughs> for a long time. Uh, and that's a, that's a strain on a family. And so you really need to make sure they are going to support you, whether they're supporting you as a volunteer and coming out with you, or, or they're going to pick up extra child care duties that you used to have, or they're going to work overtime and make up some money you lost, or whatever it is, that you need to make sure they're on board because their lives are also going to be exposed if you start getting uh, credibility and they start coming after you. So they need to kind of know some of that and take that seriously. So it's a very serious conversation to have with your loved ones. No one wants divorce to be the end of the election cycle. <laughs> I'm sure we have those four stories. Um, yeah, and I would say, you know, it's funny, as you were saying, oh, well, if you have someone to do this, it's one thing you don't have to do. And then I'm like, so that you can do other things right. instead. Right. Um, it's not that, oh, well, I'll have all these amazing volunteers, and I'll just show up to a few things and speak. No, it's so that you can take that time and do what a candidate needs to be doing, which is basically fundraising, which we'll, Aaron will talk about later. And the other thing on the winability side, the seat I ran for, and the reason I jumped in there is because it was a newly created uh, district for the state legislature. Um, there was not an incumbent, although there was someone who had been in the state legislature running on the Republican side, and there wasn't a Democratic candidate. So on the winability side, those were pluses. And we, with a little bit more on a couple things that I'm not going to go into, we probably could have sold that seat. Um, and so as it was, we got 20,000 votes. Which is not chump change for somebody with no money, no team, no money. It's doable, but you've got a hump it and you need help. Yes. Amen. All right. So I'm just trying to speed things along because we've got a lot of other stuff to cover. Um, so just this is the arc of the campaign year. And let me just also say this I'm coming from sort of a Northeast old school machine style kind of context, and it may be different here. So please chime in. And if I have valid access in the wrong season, like you tell me how it goes here in Florida. Because if there's anything I've learned in the Green Party is that if you know one state, how one state works, you know how one state works. Um, it's <laughs> totally different everywhere you go. How parties qualify, whether there's even party registration. I mean, it's like a completely different landscape out there. So again, like this is sort of what works for my the kind of Northeast old school machine style politics. And so if it's different, please tell me. All right, so now through February. And when I say now, I mean now, right? Like there's no time that's too early to start. So you're in exploration phase, right? You're, you're figuring out all this stuff, you know? Like, well, what is the winability and who will be the candidates next year to the best of your ability? So who said that they looked up on, it was you. You were looking, there's already two potential Democrats, right? Good to know, right? I mean, they're already thinking about it, and it, they're far enough along that their name is on some bad ballot PDA and said, you know, we're, we've got a committee that's going, you know, they're filing up reports already. Build your campaign committee. You cannot do this alone. Comma, you cannot do this successfully alone. Let me just say that. And I'll, let me just say this, I'm gonna be really blunt. If you don't have the leadership skills to get five other people to help you do this, then you have no business being an elected congressman, town commissioner, whatever, whatever, right? Like, if you can't get people to help you do this, why do you think that you can represent your entire community, all right? So, like, and I'm, you know, I'm sick of hearing Green Party candidates, like, well, no one's helping me, and no one's doing this, and no one's donating money, like, well, why not? Like, what are you doing to get it to happen? And so build your campaign committee, the person who's gonna chair your campaign, who's gonna keep you in line as the candidate, who's gonna find those volunteers, do the financials, yada, yada. There's a laundry list of stuff to do. 
the final slide is that laundry list, and you need people to help you do it all. You might have to start filing paperwork, um, figure out what that paperwork is. I, I have unfortunately been in campaigns, Jerry Hockula, where we missed one piece of paperwork on one day, and bam, she's not on the ballot and it's a write in. If anyone wants to see my awesome stamp that goes into the group that happened. Um, build your infrastructure, build all the stuff that it takes to do this well. In some ways, it's like any small business, right? Like, you know, you go to a restaurant when they first open, and they don't really quite have it down right, the food's not coming out of the restaurant, out of the kitchen fast enough, the wait step, like everything's kind of chaotic. It's, we're like you're opening a new restaurant here. Like your campaign is a new entity, it's a new business, it's a new thing, and you gotta figure all that stuff out. And so it takes time. Bumble, do that bumbling, you know, you know have your soft opening before you launch for real, for real. Do the research, what are the issues? What are the policies, what's going on? You know, if you're running for Congress, you're thinking about national issues. If you're running for county commissioner, what are the issues in this county? What are, you know? What matters? What's on people's minds? What are your policy positions? And get, don't get so specific that people can pick apart every little thing. But you have to have. You can't just say like, well, the Green Party cares about climate change. Well, great. And therefore, what is the county? What can be done at the county commissioner level about climate change? Something. I don't want, know what that answer is right this minute. But Robin is certainly going to find out if that's one of her issues. You want to start doing one-on-ones with key influencers and constituencies, like start having lunch and coffee and going to meetings and, you know, like, hey, Robin, you know, I think I might be thinking about running for office next year. Like, what do you think about that? And is she, like, running away screaming, like, oh, that's the worst idea I've ever heard? Mm -hmm. Or is she like, oh, yeah, maybe, that's cool. People who represent other groups, whether it's neighborhood association, labor, women's groups, LGBT groups, all kinds of constituencies, geographic areas, just people who are well-respected, that you are friends with, hopefully, and start get, start running this up the flagpole and see what they think. You're gonna start fundraising. Sneak preview, fundraising is on every single slide. <laughs> it is, all, unfortunately, all about raising money. Thank you for keeping this a lot. Oops, sorry. Oops, that, that. Okay. Um, get to know the office. So one thing I often recommend to people, if you want to run for county commissioner, because this is, this is much more doable than Congress, go to the meetings. Go to the meetings now. Just see what it's like, right? It's probably really boring. But, you know, to find out, like, who's not showing up? Is everyone actually there doing their thing? Or do you have some absentee commissioners collecting a salary and not doing much? Listen to what they're saying. Are they saying really dumb, stupid things? Are they doing stuff? Are they just warming a seat? Like, figure out how it works, because the more that you observe and witness will be more things for you to talk about on the stump when you're running for office. There's some website that tells you what they're supposed to do. Or maybe there's still someone who, for whatever newspaper, like, is the local politics reporter. Take them out some lunch and say, like, what do you think? What's going on? Um, old commissioners. Yeah, old commissioners, yeah. Right. Um, go to the meeting. Go to the right? meeting, right. county commission, right. every county meeting, go to as many of their committee meetings as you can to so see what they're doing, see what they talk about, see what jobs they're already on, see what the positions of the people already on the commission are. Watch them do it. Yep. And there's probably a set of staff that are civil servants that are there no matter who is actually elected, who sort of actually run the show. If your passion might be more on statewide issues, but you're running for something local, there is a connection and you just have to figure out what it is and learn to use the language that is like, well, Tallahassee is doing this, and so therefore, we need to do this in my area, you know, so, um, all right, so learn the nomination procedure. Just because you're a Green and you're awesome and you're going to run for something does not mean that your Green Party is actually going to nominate you. And so um, figure out what it takes to be the nominee of the Green Party because every place is different and just know how to get on the ballot, whatever way that is, whether it's internal to the Green Party and or what the state or county says, and usually it's a combination of both, right? There's some, there's processes internal and external. In some states, there's actually green primaries, right? Well, how do you qualify for that, all that? Um, get a professional headshot. Now, why not, right? It's just check it off your list. It's something you will need and make sure that happens. And then this is where, and you also want to start, and this is to some degree is the exploration, 
but some level of vote analysis and data crunching, right? Like how winnable is this race? And it could be very winnable. There's all kinds of weird reasons why some sneaky third party candidate might actually crack through. And so how many people voted in the last comparable county commission election? How, what was the top vote getter? Is it, you know, are you, is it a head to head race or is it you're electing three people out of a pool of six? What are all those dynamics? And if you don't know how to do that math, and I wouldn't necessarily expect that you do, find someone who does, they do exist, and they, there's actually a few of us in the Green Party who do this, and really try to get some raw numbers. Like, okay, I'm actually, I'm, I'm trying to get 10,000 votes. Like, that's what it will take to have a shot at it. And then your campaign plan, which Aaron's gonna talk about this afternoon, assuming you're on the to-win track, is like, well, what does it take to get 10,000 votes? In, in terms of money, in terms of door knocking, phone calling, mailing, you know, just like what does it take to get that number and work your way back from the end. The, the start with the end in mind and work your way back. All right, in the spring, you might do a formal launch or announcement. You know, when I talked about that restaurant analogy, right? You know, your soft launch and then your grand opening. Um, website launch, you know, this is sort of when it maybe becomes more public. This could be earlier. You could be doing all this today or next month if you're ready. Um, I mean, Seth Capperdale, who's running for governor in New Jersey, awesome campaign, by the way, he announced, I think on November 9th, the day after election day, he was ready to go. He was like, all right, 2016 is over, now we can focus on 2017, and he's out there with an announcement. Your social media is going to be launched. Developing your press contacts. I can't say this enough, you can put a press release out every single day. Like, you had a thought in your head, bam, that's a press release. Um, you're gonna do an event, there's three press releases there. The one before that says you're gonna do the event, the one the day of that says you've done, you're doing the event, and the one after that says how it went. The one and people think I'm crazy, you're gonna do the event, the one the day of that says you've done, you're doing the event, and the one after that says how it went. And people think I'm crazy, right? I don't expect the newspaper to print all three, but it's, to some degree, it's a volume game. And it's about sort of putting out to both the media, to your constituency and the general public, that your campaign is active and doing stuff. And the more and more you put out there, it's like, oh, like, wow, like Robin's really like running around town and meeting with a lot of groups. Like there's something there's something there there. As opposed to like, oh yeah, she announced the last meeting and I haven't heard. So again, this is your infrastructure. infrastructure right? You can be doing you don't really already have this, but you're not telling you your person about it. You can email stuff that never happened. Start building it. Because you don't want to be doing that the night before you're trying to get a release out and then being like, oh, who are we actually send this to? Which is that you know, build it now when there's a little less urgency and sandy. You don't want to do things the night before if you can help. Billy, you probably have a press list that's like 200. But I think that that means that 200 people actually read our stuff. Some of those people are, I mean, there is probably a good number to start with. But the local papers, the little neighborhood papers, those are actually more important these days because that's the news that isn't on Facebook and Twitter as often. Who knows how important the actual old school newspaper is anymore or, you know, the local ABC channel or whatever. But just all of the above, as many, you know, there's a key blogger. Um, and even though it's not really an official press contact, I would say who's the local chair of your art revolution group, whatever. Who do you want to know what you're doing and who will repost it or spread the word in some kind of way? And so if your party doesn't have that local list or your state doesn't have a list where they can break out your local folks, start building it. This is the infrastructure. Yeah, so on the media thing, I would assign that job to somebody, somebody to find and put yeah. together your media contact that you want to look for people. If you're one of your issues is gentrification, who's been writing and reporting on that issue? Who's been writing and reporting on the environmental side of the education? Whatever your issues are, those are the people you want at the top of your list. And then, of course, any contacts you have in any other groups, whether it's labor or Sierra Club or some other environmental groups, and, and make sure the social media drives them into those areas, too. Yeah. And radio and TV, they all have contacts. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you write a private press release, it, like, like said, it looks like an article. Media is lazy. They will just, if you can give them something with minimal editing that they can use and they've done their job for the day and file their story, right. they will love Short it. Short and sweet. And then it's also, I mean, it's also for your own. It's content for your own website. It's content that you can put out on social media. In some ways, it doesn't even matter if, like, I, I always say, hold a press conference. I, it doesn't matter that no one came, right? 
take a lot of good tight photos where it's all about you and you put and then you put it out on social media and it like it doesn't matter. Like whatever you said is still important. And that, well, I'm working on a campaign right now for Superior Court in Pennsylvania. And we had a kickoff event in May in front of the town. So the guy who's running for Superior Court is an awesome guy named Jules Mermelstein, former Democrat. And when he was Democrat, he served for 20 years in at the township commission level. And so he announced his campaign in front of the township building where he had served for many years. And you know, at some point it's kind of like this weirdly cold, windy day, and there were maybe like a half a dozen people, a dozen people, and like it was all like the choir, right? Like no new random person just came to this event. It was all us. And he almost was like, we should even bother? And I was like, yes, we should bother. Because we're gonna we're gonna Facebook live it and the masses will not know that there was only five people here. And it's practice, right? Like, you know, like we had some guy giving a fundraising pitch and he wasn't that great at it, but it was his first time. And so let him bomb in front of five people who are part of the family. It's an exercise, you know, and take everything, turn it into a teachable moment, turn it into something that you can sort of put on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and touch 17 other things and make it look better than it was. Because you know what, that's how the other, that's what the other guys are doing. So op-eds are different. Okay, so Robin's question was about op-eds. So op-eds are opinion pieces, right? And so if that's another strategy for getting yourself out into the press, usually in order to have an op-ed printed, you have to have some voice that the, the media respects. So like, are you already a leader in some kind of way where if Robin Harris has an opinion, we're going to print it? Having run for office is a great way to develop that credibility. So we have folks, and this is, I think, someone in the, like, why run for office is an issue reason. Um, we have people who run for office, have not won, but they made a name for themselves. And now, when something's happening, you know, two years later, the media might go to them and say, well, what do you think? What's the Green Party perspective on this? You know, would you write an op-ed? Or if they can write an op-ed, they might actually print it. But that's an opinion piece. is a distinct thing. A press release is like the who, what, when, where, why, this is what's happening. And it's better if you're, it's a press release about what you're doing. Like we opened a campaign office, we were knocking on doors in this low income community that everyone forgets about, versus just I think X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I wanted to say one more quick thing about media because you have like three different kinds of things that you send out to media. Um, you, have, you have press releases. Usually I'm going to give a press release to a reporter, for example, after a press conference. It's going to be a hard copy. It's going to be a packet. You have press statements. That's basically when you're responding to a policy issue, something has happened, and the candidate is going to make a statement about that responding to the press. And a third type is a media advisory. The reason we use media advisories is because we don't want to give the press too much information about an event. We want to pique their interest, but if we give them all the information, then they just might as well type it. So we let them know we're having an event. But we don't print a full press release. It's just a quick who, what, where, when, why. Um, but it's it's a, a media advisory is a, a very uh, short uh, uh, release to the press, and, and and that's what it's designed to do. It's it's designed to get the editor to go. Maybe, yeah, it's a teaser. Maybe there's something going on down at this. I should send a reporter down just to see what's happening. And, and you'll notice that when you employ that type of a tactic, and you don't say every single thing you're going to say at the event, you'll find you get. Which may be changing based on the way social media has transformed our lives. But um, I mean, generally speaking, the point is to simply be constantly telling the rest of the world what you're doing. Don't just do it. Tell the people who didn't make it to your event what you were doing. You went door knocking, put it out there. Because there's so many green candidates who are, quite frankly, running paper campaigns. And they're not actually doing a whole lot. And it's hard to know from a thousand miles away what is actually happening. And the more you sort of say, like, this is what I'm doing, people will say, oh, like, this is a real thing. This is active. Like, this guy's really, you know, Dan is out there knocking on doors and talking to people and kissing babies and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, like, that's what makes it look credible and real. And it's hopefully a snowball effect that then it becomes more real and then it seems more real and then it becomes, you know, like that's, you know, you want that sort of upward spiral. Um, so you're going to maybe be thinking about ballot access, you know, do you need to collect a bunch of signatures to get on the ballot? Hopefully not, but if you do, whatever that process is, 
Um, you might be trying to break into primary debates. So this is something that we struggle with all the time in Philly because it's essentially a one-party town. And so the, pro the Democratic primary is the election. And so, and, and so we often get this like, well, you're not in the Democratic primary, so we're not inviting you to debate. And then in October, well, we're not having a debate. It's clearly like the Democrats are gonna win. Like, what's, the, what's there to debate? <laughs> um, so one time, one year, we had a really energetic young guy running for state rep. And he got, he didn't quite get into the debate, but what he, he smartly did is he asked if he could speak at the end. So he, like, there was five people running for state representative by Democrats in the primary and in us. And he basically got it where they would have their little debate, or and mostly because there's five people, they each just got to speak and take questions. And then he would also get to speak at the very end. And so at least with, like letting people know that we exist and we're here, and we would turn up um, and really show that we had some credibility. So just think about that. If you can get in, great. If not, but like really try to, you know, if those things are happening, try to find a way to get your foot in the door. Social media gives you that ability. I mean, in 2000, when Ralph Mayer was excluded, his tactic was to basically go and get arrested and make a big scene out of it, you know, which is great too, but only gets you so far. But I think, yeah, the ability to sort of respond in real time and make it seem as if you were there, which I think, obviously, for something like County Commissioner, maybe that there's not the audience for that online. But um, yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily have any formal training around that, but we'll add it to our list of things that we should be thinking about. Um, all right, so we're going to go to lots of meet and greets. Again, community meetings, all about making sure that people know you exist, especially with local elections that are not super sexy, right? No one's sitting around the kitchen table debating about, like, who are you going to vote for Superior Court? come November, <laughs> um, you know, it's just not the thing that keeps people up at night. Um, so you've got to get your get yourself out there. I mean, the folks in this corner, like, nobody knows that the Green Party exists, right? Well, that and they may not know you exist as a candidate. So you've got to be out there hustling and getting in front of as many people as you can all the time. Um, you're fundraising, right? It's every, all day, every day, you're fundraising. Maybe not all day, but three hours a day, you're fundraising. I know, it's, it's scary. Um, you've got to secure the nomination, however that might be, and you want to be doing some voter targeting analysis, and I know Eric is going to talk about that later at some point, right? Okay, a little bit. People will give, I mean, at the national level, so I'm a short plug for my national treasurer role, give money, give often. So we have people who are sustainers. I'm one, every month I give an amount that just comes directly out of my debit card, I don't even see or think about it anymore. Many sustainers will also give individual donations when asked one time. People want to get, you know, the worst thing to have to do is say no, right? The, I mean, obviously you don't want people to like unsubscribe from your list and say never talk, talk to me again. But you'd be surprised, like you can hit that same well multiple times. When Jill, so Sherry's campaign, raised over $100,000. It's like the most I've ever seen for a Green Party campaign, right? It's not a normal thing that you should pen your sights on. And part of it was just the magic of coming out of 2016 and the Jill slash Bernie bump. And Jill did a fundraising email for Sherry on a Friday. I want to say it was a Thursday. Sent it out. It generated like $12,000 in one day. Now, Rick, I, so let me just say, before you start all calling me and saying I want that too, like, <laughs> there has been diminishing returns. It has not, like, we've done similar emails for other candidates, and it's not produced the same. Now, part of, you know, Sherry was her VP candidate, she had national name recognition. It was in February when, like, nothing else was going on. There's a lot of factors. She did another email to the same group three days later, and it raised another six. So this myth that, like, oh, I can only ask people one time, or I already asked them like forget all that. I'm not saying to bombard people, but in my experience, greens are on the way other end of the spectrum where they're just like so paranoid about asking people for money. And then you sort of get yeah. closer to the other side and ask, ask, ask. Because it takes money to do this well. And we're gonna talk about that later this afternoon. All right, so in the summer, I'm doing outreach, door knocking, phone banking, social media, the sort of meat and potatoes of the campaign more press releases, ballot access perhaps still going on, and Philly, we 
we have until August 1st to get on the ballot. The house parties, love parties, hogging waves, literally just standing on the corner with your son and going, woo! Um, maybe you're going to the gay pride parade. Maybe you're doing other neighborhood festivals. Like all that kind of stuff is typical summer activity. Volunteer recruitment, big time, and voter ID. And thank you for educating me on our call Tuesday night. Voter targeting is sort of thinking about, all right, if I can't cover the entire county, because that's huge, you know, what subgroups am I going to target? And it could be this neighborhood, because it's had a higher green vote turnout in the past. It could be certain demographics, like I'm really going to go for people of color, because they need to hear our message, our message is more in line with their issues. We need to diversify the Green Party, a hundred other reasons for that. You know, there's ways to sort of take that large territory and break it down. That's voter targeting. Voter ID is as you interact with individual voters. I knocked on Robin's door, I had a conversation with her, and she's like, man, you're awesome. I'm totally going to vote for you. Great. She just gets a five in my little database. I knock on Aaron's door, and he's like, he slams the door in my face. Okay, he's not going to vote for me. He gets a one. And literally keeping that list and figuring out who your supporters are. You know, if your magic number is 10,000 votes, how many four and fives have you gotten this week? You know, how are we getting up to that 10,000 mark? Um, and so that's what voter ID is, and we can talk about that later. It, this is about building something new and different. So I was just at this, like, for work, I was at this, like, leadership thing for the last two days in Philly. And it's like this mix of like nonprofit and corporate and government, you know, it's like all mucky mucks. And then, you know, one of the keynote speaker was some guy from Deloitte who was talking about, you know, like new revolutions in business, whatever. But the thing he said that really struck me and it was interesting and sort of applying it to this context was, and he was talking more about like innovation, you know, thinking about like the disruption in economy, you know, in economics, like, you know, Uber has totally like destroyed the taxi industry, right? Ever. And so his analogy was like, the old way of doing things is the core. And everyone's trying to figure out what the new edge is, right? Like the new innovative thing. And what people traditionally have done is, and again, this is kind of in a business context, you know, they've innovated, some, innovated something over here, and then they try to bring it, that model back to the core and scale it up. And it fails. And he said the reason is because you have antibodies in your own organization who are so invested in the old way of doing things, right, <laughs> um, that they kill it. And it just doesn't work. And so he said, instead, instead of trying to take the edge and bring it to the core, just do the edge and make it bigger and better. And eventually the core will follow, because they'll have to, and it becomes the new core. And I was like, man, that's actually really, like, I'm going to think about that for a while. So maybe, you know, in our best, you know, we're the edge. And it's no longer about taking our values and our whatever and trying. It's not about influencing the old core, i.e. the Democrats. Like, we're the new core, and they will eventually figure it out. Hopefully. That's not great. Okay, so I'm going to talk.